This morning, our title is Jesus is Crucified. This is the very heart of the Christian message. Jesus died in our place to open a way to God. And since we're focusing on Jesus' death this morning, we are going to also observe communion later in our service. And following on from the formal part of our service, please join us downstairs if you're able for um, a cup of tea or coffee, that's a great time to get to know each other better and even speak a bit more about what we've heard during the morning service. You're also welcome to join us later tonight at 6pm for our corporate prayer time and Phil Davis will be speaking at that gathering. On Monday at 7.30 we'll be continuing our Foundations series in the Bible study and we're going to be thinking about the sufficiency of scripture and why we have 66 books and also we'll pray together. On Wednesday, Cameo starts at 9.30 as usual, but then after that there are no other activities uh, during the week because it's our church weekend away, so our Friday youth clubs are closed this week. Um, hopefully if you're coming on the church weekend away, you've had the information from David and Nicola, uh, we'll just speak to them if you do have any questions. Next Sunday, obviously it's the church weekend away, but for those who are not signed up for that, there'll be a service here as usual at 10.30, and Joe Hayes will be taking that entire service, and we're very grateful to him for coming to speak next Sunday morning. And there will be no evening service, so no evening service next Sunday. It's probably worth me bringing a few announcements for the following week because we'll, those the weekend away will not be here to hear the announcements. So this is the following week, not to be confused with this week. And the, in the following week, there are no activities in the church. There's, there's no Monday evening, no Wednesday, um, no Friday youth clubs uh, because it's our Easter break. But there will be a Good Friday service on Friday, the 7th of April at 10.30 a.m. here at church and then on the Saturday will be Easter praise held at St. Thomas's at 7 p.m. and then it will be our usual Easter services on Easter Sunday at 10.30 and also 6 p.m. So please don't be confusing that week with this week where there is a Bible study, there is cameo and um, that's the following week. But please just see the email for all the, that information. Let's be still for a moment uh, in the presence of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads and quietly just for a moment ask him to move amongst us. We are dependent on the Holy Spirit. We need him to bring the presence of Jesus to us. Let's just for a moment, let's just acknowledge our utter dependence on the Lord. And then I'll read some words from the Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. We're about things of, that are of first importance this morning. <coughs> Father, we pray that as we consider these things that you tell us in your word are of first importance, that you please would give us eyes to see the glory and the majesty 
and the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our prayer is in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand to sing, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I find a place to stand. together and let's pray. <coughs> Glorious Father, it is our, our joint desire to see your name honoured and praised. We are gathered here together in this place to celebrate your greatness and splendour. We recognise that the fact we're here is because of your grace in our lives. Even our delighting in Christ is because of your work in our hearts. In the past we had no thought for you. You had many thoughts about us. We didn't desire you. We didn't long to praise you. Instead we were quite content going our own way. Rejecting your son. But thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus on a rescue mission. Thank you that he came to seek and to say, lost sinners like us. And so we are so glad to be able to take our stand beneath the cross of Jesus. We are glad to be able to acknowledge this morning that yes, we are wretched sinners, people who have dishonoured you, and yet, because of your grace and love, you are willing to pay that ultimate price the blood of your son, so that we can be reconciled, brought into your family. Thank you that we, the church, are your bride. You have washed us and you continue to do so. Please forgive us for the times when we commit spiritual adultery, when we give our love to other things other than you, when we give our affections and ambitions to things that are so inferior to you. Please continue to work in us and make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are in power over us, we're instructed to do this by your words. We pray for our King, the Prime Minister, the Government, Parliament, and many others. We ask that you would make them wise. 
please help them to use the authority that you have given them in such a way so that good and right is promoted in this land. May they uphold laws that are in keeping with your own. Please, would they refuse to deviate from what you say is good and true? Thank you for the gospel freedom that we do enjoy in this country. We know that we face social rejection for not being ashamed of you and your words, but thank you that we can meet in this way without any fear of arrest. But please, strengthen our brothers and sisters around the world that are not as fortunate as us. Those who risk their lives to meet together. Like them, we have said we're willing to take our stand beneath the cross of Jesus and follow you. We sung things in the past like I'd rather have Jesus than anything for them that is a, a reality Father may our confession in song be the reality of our lives and if the day comes when our profession is put to the test like theirs is please strengthen our hands please strengthen our resolve mm. but for them this day we do ask that you would keep them, str uh, keep them strong keep them safe Help them to keep preferring following Jesus than anything else. <coughs> this morning, we're gathered together. Please help us to continue to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus. Please provide for all our physical and spiritual needs. Keep us away from evil. You know that we're so prone to wander, so please put a hedge about us. And may this service be a time when truly we are strengthened in our inner being by your Spirit. Be glorified in our gathering, we pray, because we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've <coughs> been having some different activity focuses uh, during the last few weeks. We're going to have another this morning. Eddie is going to come to speak to us about the work of mission within our church family. Thank you, Eddie. So here's the mission activity report. Uh, the mission team currently comprises of Kelly Seahorn, Kath Jones, Billy Walken and myself. Uh, we act as the mission secretaries, secretaries for one of the four core missions. Uh, Kelly does leprosy mission. Uh, Kath does uh, good news for everyone in April next month. Uh, Billy heads up the Platform 67 work and I do SIM where we support Magumi and Helen exactly out in Malawi. We have quarterly team meetings to pray and to discuss the distribution of gifts to gospel related causes and we do encourage and appreciate inputs from within the fellowship to assist with our deliberations. Our mission budget is agreed by the church members at the members meeting and for 2023 it was agreed to tithe 10% of our church income this amounted to a very significant £8,300 for this year. Uh, as a church, we are members of the North West Gospel Partnership and uh, support the Gospel Mission Vision. We are also members of the FIEC. And this year, a proportion of our annual fees have been covered from the mission budget. Church members uh, uh, agree the proportion of the mission uh, budget to be allocated to the four core missions and during the focus month we collect additional gifts from supporters within the church family. Our pastor holds a monthly Sunday evening mission service and slotted in between the core <coughs> mission focus months are reports from other missions. Uh, included in mission other are UBN, United Beach Mission, where the other Sunday we had a, a report uh, from James Lydon and uh, if anybody is interested in serving on beach mission on a beach mission team then as an encouragement we do pay registration fees and have the subsistent costs from within the mission budget. Uh, it's been good for us to continue to support uh, the Ukraine relief work by a Slavic Gospel Association and we thank you for all your prayers and financial gifts during 2022. The latest newsletter this morning is uh, on the uh, tables in the school room. <coughs> Silk Road Ministries are also included in this group of uh, Mission Other, uh, where Billy Campbell heads up the work in Myanmar. <coughs> Trouble still rages out there and many 
people have been displaced. And our support gift for 2022 went to the Children's School for Refugees. <coughs> With his wife, Jeannie, is uh, the one responsible for the Hope House complex in Cambodia, which we have supported for many years. Uh, support for youth ministry within churches and schools. This is covered by gifts to Joe Hayes, Cascot, Sports Reach, and CCYC, where Nick and Sir are trustees, and no doubt will be the subject of a, pro a report later this year. Uh, as a fellowship, we support the Ashton Asylum Seekers work, uh, with Billy coordinating gifts via the boxes on the church landing. Uh, there are opportunities to serve in this work. Uh, not only by filling the boxes, but by via the weekly gatherings and home visiting. In October, it's uh, a, privilege, a privilege for us to assist Blyswood with their annual shoebox project, and Kelly doubles up here as our coordinator. We have a biennial visit from Sazru, where the work and ministry among the armed forces is shared. During 2022, we also support the Muslim outreach by a reach across. Uh, David and St Davis and Steph at North New Tribes Mission at North Fort College. Uh, Caring for Life, the Christian Institute. David Roostoffer and his work amongst the Malenki people in Senegal. Operation Mobilisation. <coughs> and we uh, cover the persecuted church via open doors. We have a good balance in the missions we support and the overall split between overseas and UK missions is roughly 50-50. One of our team aims is to keep mission on the church's radar by making available newsletters uh, containing prayer items, some of which are placed regularly on the schoolroom table downstairs, so please take them for information and prayer. Our pastor always includes a mission prayer slot at our Monday Bible study and prayer meetings. Uh, the team are currently arranging some local outreach and over the Easter period we are distributing copies of uh, that excellent readable 10 of those Life magazines and thank you for those who helped with the stickers last Sunday morning and if anybody else wants to help with the distribution well just please make this known. So please continue to pray and support for this work. Thank you. Wow, far-reaching is the work um, from Hope Church. Um, incredible to be able to support all those different missionaries at home and overseas. Let's bow our heads together and let's pray for this vital activity within the church family. Father, we rejoice in what we've just hit, heard. Uh, we know that we have a responsibility to seek to obey Jesus' words, to make him known and make disciples. Uh, right across the world. Thank you that we can do that through prayer, through finances, and also through uh, going ourselves. We thank you for all the different organisations that we have sought to support over the last year, and we just pray that you'll continue to prosper them and grow them. Help us all as individuals to have a heart for mission, a heart for seeing the Lord Jesus honoured in the lives of those as, who as yet don't love him and know him. And may we do everything we can to support this vital ministry in Hope Church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to our first a reading from the Bible. Liz is going to come to read to us from John chapter 18. If you have a Bible, please turn to John chapter 18. And Liz will read to us the first 11 verses. Thank you, Liz. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, 
went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, uh, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. His servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Please all stand once again to sing What Kind of Love is This? 750, if you're using a book, What Kind of Love is This? That gave itself for me. I am the guilty one, yet I go free. Let's stand to sing. <coughs> Church in Crest. We're going to read from John chapter 19. Our second scripture reading, John 
chapter 19. I'm going to read verse 1 to verse 18. <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realise I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. The Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him down on the, and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was day of preparation, the Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. <coughs> Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Amen. If the young people would like to head down to their classes and crash downstairs as well. <coughs> pray once again. Father, we do ask that you would draw near to us, please. Please speak to us. Please help us to be those who hear, believe, and put into practice what we hear, because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A pearl is formed when an irritant, such as a piece of shell, becomes accidentally lodged in an oyster's soft inner body. This causes the oyster to secrete a crystalline solution which um, surrounds the irritant in layers. And this continues until a pearl is formed. Through irritation, suffering and pain, something precious and valuable comes into existence. I wonder how that first pearl was ever discovered. A couple of hundred years ago, divers would risk their lives diving to depths of up to 100 feet to retrieve pearl oysters. There in the dirt and the darkness, 
something beautiful could be found. This week our title is Jesus is Crucified. And among the dirt and darkness of what is mankind's evilest moment, as Jesus the eternal Son, almighty God in the flesh, the Creator, willingly suffers an unjust execution at the hands of his creation, a priceless treasure is for. <clears throat> a way is opened back to God. Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, was said to have a reality distortion field. He would enter a room of programmers and demanded that a job that would probably take several months to complete, he would demand it would have to be completed by the end of the week, or maybe a breakthrough in software such as round corners on icons, which is just a run of the mill now. He would demand his staff learn how to code such a program, and his staff would protest, claiming such things were impossible. But Steve wouldn't take no for an answer. He would continue to demand that they did what he asked, make his ideas a reality, and often those programmers would work into the early hours, and his deadlines were met. His ideas became realities. However, we need to be very, very clear. Willpower, determination, and resolve cannot make a way back to God. The way is barred. That angel with the flaming sword that God dispatched to guard the way back to the tree of life is symbolic for a, a big no entry sign. There is no way back into God's presence. If you try and make a way back to God, if, if you make it back to God, you will be destroyed. There is no way back unless God makes a way back. And the best news is that God has made a way back. Last week we heard that Jesus is the way and there is no other way. He is the way, the truth and the life. And this week we see that the way back is made through Jesus' death. Our question is, how was the way to God opened by Jesus? And the answer is, they crucified him, which is John 19, 18. The Apostle Paul says that this is of first importance. Even if we searched all the history books in every library in the entire world, we would not find an event more worthy of our thoughts and attention like we are considering this morning. Three very straightforward points. Jesus is arrested, Jesus is sentenced, and Jesus is crucified. First, Jesus is arrested. If you have a Bible, please turn to John 18, verses 1 to 11. In verse 1, we're told that Jesus is with his disciples, and they cross over the Kidron Valley to an olive grove. A couple of interesting things to point out about the Kidron Valley and this olive grove. Many years before Jesus, there was a king called Solomon. And Solomon instructed one of his subjects not to cross the Kidron Valley. He was told if he crossed the Kidron Valley, it would be at the pains of death. Basically, he was on probation. And the terms were, stay in the capital city, Jerusalem. He chose to leave the capital city. He chose to cross over the Kidron Valley, and he was subsequently put to death. And now we read of Jesus crossing over the Kidron Valley. Events are now in motion. Cogs are turning. Soon Jesus will be put to death. Jesus goes to an olive grove. An olive grove is a place, obviously, where olives grow. And those olives, that fruit, is taken either to be eaten or to be pressed and crushed so that that fruit releases its precious oil. Soon Jesus will be pressed. He will be crushed. Soon Jesus will be pressed, tempted not to obey his father but to deviate from the plan. He will be crushed. His blood will be spilt. His precious blood to make a way back to the father for all who believe. 
So Jesus crosses the Kidron Valley to this olive grove with his disciples, all but one. Judas is in the process. One of his close disciples, <laughs> Judas, is in the process of betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows from the past that Jesus and his disciples, he would have gone with them, often used to visit this olive grove. And so he goes to the grove with soldiers, with Jewish officials. They have lanterns, they have torches, they have weapons. They are going to arrest Jesus. This is an intimidating mob. If you met this mob, you would expect that they were going to capture some wild beast. You would expect them to be going to capture some notoriously violent criminal or perhaps a demon-possessed man that nobody could restrain. But in fact, they are not going to arrest such a person. They are going to arrest the one who opened the eyes of the blind, who healed the sick, who fed the hungry, who calmed the storm, who defended the vulnerable. They're going to arrest the one who said, let the little children come to me, and whose parents gladly took their babies so that he could take them up in his arms and bless them. John records for us an amazing verse, verse 4. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus knows this mob is approaching. He knows what they want. He knows the depth of Judas's betrayal. Judas was willing to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. In today's terms, that probably won't pay for your heating bill in the month of January. That's what he gave Jesus up for. And so Jesus... He knows that this mob will take him and physically abuse him. And he knows, Jesus does, that that is just the beginning. He knows everything that will follow on from there. Don't think Jesus is unaware of everything that's going to take place over the next few hours. This is the path he is willingly walking down. Just look at the evidence with me. John makes it very clear that Jesus is a volunteer in this. So on this occasion, it's remarkable. Jesus goes to the mob, he asks the mob who they're looking for, and then we get verse 5. They respond, Jesus of Nazareth. And so Jesus just responds to them, I am he. And what happens next? Did you notice? Verse 6, Jesus said, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. This is incredible. At the beginning of the Gospels, we read about how Jesus called his disciples. He went and he said, follow me. There was something so compelling about the call of Jesus that they gladly left everything to follow him. And see, we, here we see the same power at work. Jesus' words, his simple response, I'm me, I'm Jesus. That powerful word from Jesus causes this mob to be powerless and simply fall to the ground. But when they fall to the ground, Jesus doesn't run. He doesn't try to escape. He asks them again. It's, it's like he's inviting them. Please come and arrest me. I'm not going anywhere. I'll look at verses 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So uh, Jesus commands Peter to, to put the sword away. So the, the mob falls over. All this is going on. Jesus could have told his followers to fight. Yet Jesus doesn't run from the mob. He doesn't tell sword swinging Peter to put the sword, uh, to keep swinging that sword. No, he tells him to put it away. Jesus is willing to be arrested. Isn't he incredible? Just consider everybody else in this account. Judas betraying the God-man. The mob just have mischief in mind. They intend to cause harm to the creator who they do not recognize. The disciples pulling out weapons, self-preservation, not following the Father's plan. And then Jesus, on the other hand, is absolutely selfless. Look at what he says as he's been arrested in verse 8. 
I told you that I am he, Jesus answered, if you were looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I gave not, I have not lost one of those you gave me. Jesus is thinking all the time about other people. He's not thinking about self-preservation. He's thinking about obeying his Father. He's thinking about making a way back to God for those who have no right to a relationship with God. Jesus is absolutely committed to the Father's plan, despite the personal cost. Look at verse 11. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? <coughs> Simon Peter is all about self-preservation. The Lord Jesus Christ is all about draining the Father's cup, sticking to the plan bringing glory to the Father, making a way, doing what's impossible for man. We are unable to obey the Father. We need someone to succeed where we fail. We need someone who will choose right where we would always choose wrong. And Jesus willingly goes through this. He knows it's the plan. He knows this will bring his Father glory. He knows the joy that awaits him on the dark side, the other side of the dark side of the tunnel. Of the cross and so Jesus was arrested incredible he knows everything and yet he willingly does this let me put this to you if you are a follower of Jesus this morning if you're saying I believe him and I've seen his call on my life and I'm choosing to follow him then God has revealed to you the mystery of his eternal plan <clears throat> which is Christ Jesus and his blood-bought bride, his church, which means you know lots of things that people in this world do not know, do not believe. See, Jesus knew what was going, he knew what was to come, he knew the Father's plan, which meant he could be obedient. What is it that we know? Well, we know where true life is found, don't we? It's not found in a bottle. It's not found in a promotion. It's not a mouse click away. It's not about always being right and getting your way. It's not about being in perfect health or being physically attractive. It's not about being true to yourself and following your heart. It's not about the latest movie or being in a particular relationship. True life is found in Christ. We know that. We know that. We also know that life and time is short, but, but this life is not all that there is. Christ will return. And we will enjoy him for all eternity. We will enjoy glorifying him. And you also know that in this short time, God is working in every circumstance for your good to make you more like his son. Wow. What a difference that makes going into the rest of today. Every situation I face, God is working in that to make me more like his son. And so don't forget this. Don't forget who you are. Live according to what you know, like Jesus, always living according to what he knew. Don't follow the example of those around us who don't know any of this stuff. Jesus is arrested. Chapter 19, Jesus is sentenced. In our last point, Jesus is arrested. We saw very clearly that Jesus was willing to be arrested. Well, in this point, Jesus is sentenced John goes to great lengths to show us the innocence of Jesus. Now, obviously, we've, we've missed out a bit of a chunk here, so let me just explain briefly what we've missed out. Upon Jesus' arrest, Jesus is taken to Jewish authorities, the Jewish rulers. The political situation in Israel at the time was the Romans, they ruled Israel, but they gave certain powers to the Jewish rulers. So certain powers, such as it would seem the Jews could, they could imprison people. They could demand people repaid, you know, compensation. And, and think low-level crime the Jews could deal with. But what they couldn't do was issue the death sentence. They were not allowed to e execute anybody. Now the Jews want Jesus dead. 
To get the death sentence means they have to take him to the Roman authorities and, and get them to give the guilty verdict. So Jesus, after facing a very inadequate trial with the Jews, is then passed to the Roman authorities. He's taken to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now let me show you some evidence from these verses that show to us that Jesus is innocent, not guilty of any crime. So first we'll go back in fact to chapter 18, and here in verse 23, this is when Jesus is still before the Jewish authority. So look we'll please with me at verse 23. <clears throat> Jesus has just been struck by a Jewish official, and then this is his reply. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? So Jesus is basically, I've not done anything wrong, and, and then the account just ends. They've got no response to that. They have no answer. Jesus is then taken to Pilate. Now chapter 18, verse 38. Jesus has been speaking to Pilate, and then Pilate asks this, what is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. <coughs> now if we go down to verse 4 in chapter 19. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Verse 6, part way through. Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Verse 12. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Neither the Jewish court or the Roman court has any evidence to pass a guilty verdict. And these limited human courts reflect the heavenly courts. In God's sight, Jesus was perfect, always obeying his Father. Jesus is so different, isn't he, to you and I? Can you imagine if we managed to have some scales at the front that were wired up to this projector, and it wasn't your way, don't worry, it's worse. Uh, imagine what was being displayed on the screen was all your sin. I think we'd all be pretty, feeling pretty nervous. Are we starting at the front row? Are we starting at the back row? How, how are we going to do this? I imagine quite a few of us would decide we need to get off early. I don't think anyone would volunteer, would they, to come and stand on the scale so we can all see. Uh, so everyone can see our thoughts, our desires, our attitudes, and some of the behaviour, even just in this last week. Now in our minds, we have different views for different sin. We often put our masks on and, and try to appear like we have it all together. And we might be pretty good at avoiding some of the sins that we perhaps would all tut at. And yet, in the Bible, what is it that God finds unpalatable? What does God want to dispel? What does he want to get rid of? These are his words. I know your deeds, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. So hand on heart this morning, how is your zeal for the Lord Jesus? Are you ablaze of desire for Christ? The eternal Son, his majesty and beauty. Or is there a hardness, a deadness, dare I say, is there a disinterest? 
and you know you should be here so you come, but if the truth be told, there are many places you would rather be. And if you were to come and stand on the scales, the thermometer of love for Jesus would be very, very bright. And then when Jesus stands on those scales, there is no sin, there is no guilt. And so this sentence, being given this guilty verdict, is the biggest miscarriage of justice a human court has ever made. Pilate knows Jesus is innocent, yet sentences him to death anyway. Please just dismiss any idea of this innocent until proven guilty nonsense in Jesus' case. Look at chapter 19, this is verses 1 to 4. This is before Pilate has issued the death sentence. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis of charge against him. Now just go back to verse 1. That's what Pilate knows. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Pilate knows he's innocent, yet he's had that done to him. Jesus willingly went into this for the glory of the Father to rescue those like you and I, who are best a lukewarm and need spitting out of Jesus' mouth. His love for you took him into that situation. God's creatures, us, on the sight of Jesus, should give him a coronation. We should go up to him and fall on our faces in the dust and say, Jesus, you are king. I give you my allegiance. I give you my life. Put me to whatever duty or task you will ask. I am your humble servant. I owe you everything. Instead, mankind, we crowned him with thorns, used our tongues to mock him, and instead of falling on our faces, we struck him in his face. No, you weren't there, but we all bear the guilt of this. Instead of giving him our allegiance, we turn our backs on him. And yet such is the brilliance of our God that he turns death into life, guilt into innocence, suffering to glory through irritation and pain, something precious and valuable is formed. Because the court of heaven also views Jesus as guilty, not as a miscarriage of justice, but our sin, our actual sin and guilt is transferred off us onto Jesus what he suffers on the cross is what you should suffer and I should suffer for all our sin. He suffers for you. He suffers for me. The people who caused him pain, we are the ones that he's given the guilty verdict for. Verse 5. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and his purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. Nicholas Zinzendorf was born into a wealthy family and he became a Christian at just a young age. After he finished university, he took a trip throughout Europe going to lots of <coughs> cultural high spots. And on one occasion, he went to a, a museum, an art museum at Dusseldorf, and he saw a painting entitled Eki Homo, which means Behold the Man. It's based on these verses in John 19, verse Five. It was a portrait of Christ with a crown of thorns pressed down on his head and blood, blood running down his face. And beneath the portrait were these words, I have done this for you. What have you done for me? <coughs> Zinzendorf, as he stood there, as it were watching his saviour suffer and bleed, he said to himself, I have loved him for a long time, but I've never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. He looked back on that occasion as absolutely life-changing. Christ facing the guilty verdict for you, for me. All this he has done for you. What have you done for him? How have you responded? 
He's done everything to make a way to God for you. Jesus is crucified. Verses 16 to 18. Crucifixion was designed to be as painful, as humiliating, as grotesque a death as you could possibly imagine. The victim's death was prolonged. They were made to feel every bone in their body. They were mocked. They were ridiculed. And we know that Jesus was there, not dying for anything he'd done, but choosing to do that for sinners. And not only was it the physical suffering he endured, the wages of sin is death. Jesus was enduring our curse. He was drinking from the cup of God's wrath. Even though he committed no sin, on Good Friday, Sam will unpack that more for us, that Jesus died for our sin. Through his death, Jesus does the impossible, making a way back to the Father. If you were to go to a Buddhist temple, you would see a statue of the Buddha, legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world, and the message is, gain salvation through understanding by becoming enlightened and reaching a state of nirvana. And in complete contrast, as we look to the cross, as we look to the place where Jesus died, we see a lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through his hands and feet. The God-man, suffering to degrees that we cannot imagine. Jesus on a rescue mission, embracing your suffering in your place, the glory of the Father, to make a way back for you to God, not overlooking your sin, but paying for it. And so now we can confidently say, because of Christ, there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that's been opened and you may go in. That Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. In the dirt and darkness of Calvary, a treasure is found. A pearl of great price was fallen. And that's yours by faith. Let's bow our heads together and have a moment to reflect on what the Lord has been working in our hearts. And then in a moment, I will pray. Father, when many people think of the events of the cross, they see nothing but weakness and failure. But Father, for, for us, for those who are being saved, we see beauty, we see strength, we see victory, we see forgiveness, we see rescue. And we just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. We honour you that your love was, was such that you endured all that. Your love for the Father was such that you followed the plan. Your love for sinners was such that you came to rescue them, to make them your treasured possession. Thank you. Give us eyes to see afresh the glory and wonder. Please dispel from our hearts apathy, lukewarmness, disinterest, Set us ablaze with desire for the beautiful Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. 
Amen. We're going to <coughs> celebrate the Lord's Supper. And what we're going to do to do that, I'm going to read some words uh, from the Bible. And then we're going to pass around these uh, symbols. And as they've been passed around, we will see uh, the communion hymn together. Let me read some words from 1 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord Jesus eats and drinks judgment on himself. This morning, anyone who says they are a follower of Jesus is welcome to eat and to drink. So we're not looking for people who are sinless, but actually people who are saying, Lord Jesus, I need your death on the cross to be forgiven. I believe that by faith. I recognise you are king and I want to follow you. If that's you, then please feel free to take the bread and eat it and take the cup and drink from it. There is nothing magical about this bread and this cup. They are symbols that help us to bring back to our mind what we've been considering in our sermon this morning. As we take this, we are strengthened in our faith because we are remembering that Jesus' body was broken for us. His blood was shed. So this morning, if that's you, please feel free to take the bread and to eat it. And then when you're handed the cup, when the cup comes round, please hold on to that. And we will all drink that together at the end as a sign of our unity in the Lord Jesus. So let's remain seated as we sing a beautiful hymn, the communion hymn, 1157, if you have a book, as um, the emblems, um, Andrew and Ray, pass them round. Let's remain seated as we sing, Behold the Lamb.
carry on singing together. And it's, if you're in the books, it's 1072. Um, it's going to be on the screen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Please be seated. 